Hell no. Everybody know it's Tyus's team anyway. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to be looking back at Monday's nine-game slate in the NBA, previewing a very, very small Tuesday where there are only three games. Michael Bolton's ready. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. We're going to, get, we're going to kick straight off into it because there is quite a bit to talk about. In today's show, so we'll start as we always do at this portion portion of the show with monstrous line of the night. It was a close race between uh, Steph Curry and LeBron James, but in the end, I go with Steph, who had 29 with four rebounds, eight assists, six triples, two steals. He was 11 of 15 from the field. A weird one of two from the line for Steph, but he was obviously fantastic. He has been fantastic. I think this is his second monstrous line of the night already for this year. He's the third-ranked player overall, averaging over 30 points, almost eight assists, shooting the absolute lights out, 53% from the the field so far this season. He was falling. Literally, some drafts I saw had him falling to 10, 11, 12, which was nonsense to me. On a per-game basis, he was probably a top five, top six guy. The rest issue, obviously, that hasn't reared its head yet. It could at some portion during this season, but he has been as excellent as ever. He's playing a shitload of minutes as well, almost 36 minutes a game through the first four games as the Warriors. Aside from today, I've probably struggled a little bit more than many people would have expected, but Steph Curry is your monstrous line of the night. Some of these things are going to drop off, like that 53% shooting, probably the eight assists, and I would have guessed the 36 minutes per night, but he has been excellent, predictably excellent, and that's always a, a good thing when predictability kicks in when we're talking about fantasy. Waiver wire line of the night. That is Tony Warren Jr. of the Phoenix Suns. It's been a real remarkable change for Warren for this season. 27 points with three triples, four rebounds, three assists, two steals, and one block on an absolutely incendiary 71% shooting from the field. Now, I was worried about Warren for this coming season. I didn't know how he was going to get the minutes. Last year, he played 33 a night and was the 82nd ranked player. The season before that, he played 31 a night and was the 91st player. So there is no way he is getting 31 minutes. Trevor Ariza, Josh Jackson, Ryan Anderson, these guys are all going to cut into his playing time. And on that note, I'm correct, because he has played under 24 minutes per game. But somehow, TJ Warren is the 33rd ranked player this season, averaging 20 points per game. And the most amazing thing here is this guy averaged one three-pointer per game last season. Attempt. One three-point attempt. Well, actually, let's do it per 36 because his minutes are so different. Last season, he averaged 1.5 three-point attempts per 36 minutes. This year, he is at 7.2. So we're talking in excess of 400% increase in his three-point attempt rate. It doesn't hurt that he's hitting them at 57% as opposed to 22% last year. And of course, that number's going to come down. We know he's always been a strong two-point shooter. He's at 59 this year, 52 the year before that, 52 the year before that. So there is some room for regression there, but he's not going to be 35 percentage points higher in his three-point shooting. So that overall value is going to dip pretty significantly. He has also upped his usage from 25 to 29, playing in the second unit. Maybe that can stick. Maybe that increased usage rate can continue. But I am uh, you know, obviously concerned. Not concerned. I'm weary when looking at his numbers here. He's averaging two steals per 36 and one block per 36, which aren't far off what he did last season, but they're still significantly elevated, especially actually the steals are, because that's almost a 50% increase in the steal rate from last season. Throw in the massive jump in his efficiency, and if those minutes stay low, then TJ Warren's value is going to drop off. So while it looks great now, I like to look at these things and go, well, he's still, he's playing well, he's shooting really, really well, but he has still played 24, 22, and 24 minutes across those three games, eight combined threes, which is obviously awesome. But will that shooting continue at that level? I'm going to uh, venture a guess and say, no, it won't. I think the steal rate will also drop, and that will probably leave TJ Warren outside the top 150. Now, I do believe he will continue to take threes and take them at a pretty high level. 
I just don't think he's going to hit them at, at the best shooter in the NBA type of level, which is currently at 57%. So if that comes down to 33 or 34%, then you know, his efficiency numbers drop off. That field goal percentage probably comes under 50%. The scoring goes down from 20 per game down to 15 per game or 16 per game. He's getting no rebounds and no assists. And if the steal rate comes down as well, then the value is going to fall pretty precipitously. Now, if you did go and add him, you could look to go and trade him if someone buys into it. And yeah, he can be a player that people get caught up in because of the high scoring numbers. But I don't think that he's someone that you have to absolutely be running to the waiver wire to go and grab onto your team because this sort of level of shooting, there is zero chance that it's able to continue. The three-point attempt rate, yes, the level of shooting that we're seeing from Tony is just not going to be able to continue at this level. It's been excellent, and the Suns fans would really enjoy it. Um, he's just not. He's, he's just not. He's not going to shoot at fifty-seven percent. I don't think anyone could make that argument that he uh, that he would. Now, since I've started this podcast, you know, a lot of people, especially you guys in the states, have been asking me, you know, for advice on this uh, on this show, especially when it comes to sports betting. And the best place for you guys over in the United States is to check out the ways for you to use, utilize your NBA knowledge and, and knowledge across other sports is to go and check out my bookie. Who you're betting on is just as important as who you are betting with, and that's why you should always be checking out my bookie. Trust me, guys, they are your best bet for this season. They've been in business for years. Great reviews online, speedy payouts. You can get uh, bets in settled and paid out in the same day and their mobile site is really really easy to use as well so go over and join my bookie and they will match your deposit dollar for dollar up to one thousand dollars by using the promo code locked on mba so go to my bookie use that promo code locked on mba and they will match you dollar for dollar up to one thousand dollars you play you win and you get paid with my bookie Let's move on now to the uh, deep league player of the night. It goes to Tyus Jones of the Minnesota Timberwolves, who is only 3% owned in Yahoo leagues. You know I'm a big Tyus Jones fan. Yeah, His ability to get minutes on this Timberwolves team is really going to be restricted to uh, situations where an injury falls. And even then, I worry that Derek Rose would come in and take those minutes. But Jones is solid. He's a guy that hovers around that top 200 sort of an area. He's playing 16 minutes a night. And he had a decent enough night. The eight points doesn't look great, three of 10 shooting, but he hit two threes, he had four rebounds, he had four assists, he had three steals and a block. And that's where Jones's value comes from, being able to generate assists, generate steals, which he always does at a pretty high rate. Uh, he's, you know, last season, six assists and over two steals per 36. He's at that similar number already this season. We expect his efficiency to rise back up. It's well down from where it was last season. And he should be owned... Uh, well, not owned. He should be rostered in uh, in deeper leagues, um, in way more than the way, way higher than the three percent that he uh, that he currently is over on Yahoo. You need to have a look at Tyus again. The upside's not that high unless something does happen to Jeff Teague. My name is Jeff. And even then, the worry is with Derek Rose. But but Tyus is someone who can produce, can produce in those numbers, put up those steals. And he did have a, a couple of solid starts last year, 15 points, four assists, four steals in a game against the Jazz in April. And then there was that stretch of time in early January where he was racking up multiple steals pretty much every night. The first four games that he started after Teague's injury, five, two, three, and two steals. So he's a, he's more of a deeper league guy at the moment, someone to go and look at in those 20 team formats, but he's around a top 200 player. And that means he should be rostered in more than the 3% of leagues that he currently is. Young Gun of the Night. That goes to Josh the Hitman Hart. Much like Steph Curry, Hart is garnering his second award for the season. He had 20 points with 10 rebounds. He hit four threes, he had an assist, and he had two steals. A strong night from uh, from the Hitman in that Lakers overtime loss to the Spurs. The Lakers still without a win this season. Uh, Hart was 8 of 14 from the field. He didn't attempt a free throw, so therefore he didn't miss or hit one. And he is currently the 37th ranked player for the season, playing 32 minutes a night. He consistently outplays Contavious Caldwell-Pope. And I don't care if he starts over KCP, as long as he continues to get this chunk of minutes. He's shooting at an unsustainable rate, 54%, but averaging 17 and 6, he is a strong rebounder. The 2.3 steals and one block that he's averaging are probably a little bit high, but I think that Hart shouldn't be on any waiver wires at this point. He does look really, really strong, and I think a top 40 finish is, is a, an outlandish expectation. But top 100 is absolutely in the realms of possibility 
for the Hitman. Um, he is he has been grabbed in, in a lot of leagues, so he might not be available in your one. Seventy four percent over on Yahoo at the moment, but he might be around, and he is someone that you should be going to look at because I don't think the minutes are really going away. It's not like yes, Rajon Rondo was suspended, but he was still getting big minutes before the Rondo suspension, not the thirty nine that he got today. Um, strong rebounding guard, high steal rate, scoring well, scoring efficiently, although we can expect some of those things to come off. Because it is the Lakers, you might be able to throw him out in a trade offer to someone and get back a top 40, maybe even top 50 player. And I don't see Hart landing in that zone by the end of the season. But someone will, uh, will in one of your leagues, someone will buy into that with Hart. I could see him being a top 80 guy this season. That's probably his ceiling in my opinion. But someone will buy in as a top 50 guy and I would consider... Doing that, I would consider throwing Josh Hart out to the Jamal Murray owner. I would be happy to take that deal and get Murray back in exchange for Hart if that was a, a trade that I was looking at in, in one of my leagues. But he was uh, he was super once again. Let's go to the dud of the night. I tell a man's not hot. That is Tyreek Evans of the Indiana Pacers. It was not a good night for Tyreek at all. Only 15 minutes. 2-3-1 and one, as the Pacers lost to the Minnesota Timberwolves. I don't understand the situation with Tyreek and why he's playing so few minutes on this team. They had a couple of blowouts early, so I did chalk it up to that. But Corey Joseph played 26 minutes. Darren Collison played 25 and Tyreek played 15 minutes. In fact, of all the players that were used, only Kylo Quinn played fewer minutes than Tyreek in this game. He's averaging you know, 10, 4, and 3 so far this season, 1.3 steals. And we know that if he was putting up you know, per 36 or, or getting those close to 30 minutes, his per 36 is at 18, 6, and 6. These are pretty good numbers with over two steals. In fact, they're very, very good numbers. And the free throw percentage for him has been a disappointment so far. I think I would look to hold him in most cases if I have him on my team. But... I'm losing a little bit of faith in what Nate McMillan is going to do with his playing time. He should be playing over Colson. He should be playing over Joseph. But if McMillan doesn't believe that, then that's not going to do us any good whether I think he deserves that or not because I'm not you know, making these rotations for the Pacers. So he's been a disappointment so far today. Obviously the worst of those performances because some of his other games, yeah, they're okay. 14-4-6, 10-5-4 with two steals. 15-3-2 with three steals and never topped 24 minutes in one of those games. And you could make make out and like I did and go, these are fine. And when the minutes come up, it'll, it'll be better. It'll be better. But now the minutes went down, his production dipped right off. So I'm giving him a little bit more time. But if, say, Josh Hart is around, I would consider making that switch. I'm not sure that I'd do it, but I feel more confident in Hart getting those minutes than I do with Tyreek. So when you're, when you're up in the air, minutes can, unless you're talking about Doug McDermott, Minutes can be the deciding factor as to who's going to have more fantasy value. And at the moment, Tyreek is struggling to get that playing time, which is um, a pretty significant disappointment. Speaking of Dougie McDirt, let's look at the plus minus goats of the day. Jonas Valanciunas had the highest net rating for players who played over 15 minutes, plus 96.9. This guy absolutely goes out and beasts in his role, and even though it's quite limited, while McDirt had a negative 105.9 net rating. That is an astonishingly poor number. He scores, and he does literally nothing else. And yeah, you've heard me talk about McDermott plenty of times. You've got to be a very, very, very deep format for McDirt to really be of any consideration. Uh, someone like Ty Jones is someone you should absolutely be having over McDirt, even if the minutes d discrepancy does uh, head in Dougie's direction, which, um, again, there's very few players who do uh, less with more. Shout out to Tone Snell. Guys, if you have a business and you are looking to reach more customers, you should reach out to my podcast because advertising on podcasts is a great way of getting new customers. Podcast listeners are 60% more likely to interact with the sponsors they hear on podcasts and our demographic is 98% male higher, educated, higher earning than usual media audiences. Email me, redrockfantasybasketball at gmail.com if you're interested in getting your business on this program. Let's go to the injury report of the day. Andy Wiggins suffered a quad contusion. He only lasted eight minutes and wasn't able to return to the game. It doesn't appear like it's a serious injury, and he said himself that he'll be ready to go for their next game. Well, stop me if you've heard this before. Chandler Parsons wasn't able to continue due to knee soreness. Yeah. Dylan Brooks also for the Grizzlies wasn't able to continue due to right foot soreness, but of course we're more concerned about Parsons. You would think the common sense thing there would be for Kyle Anderson to move into that role. Dylan Brooks actually started the second half. I, I do think that Anderson's heel is continuing to bother him, and that is limiting him to basically 20, 21 minutes per night. 
And at some point, they will lift that and uh, Anderson's minutes will start to rise. But Parsons just, he can't, he can't stay healthy. It's as pretty simple as that. Like 21, 22 minutes, three games in, and he's done with that knee, man. It's not, not a good sign for him at all. Jan Mahinmi suffered back spasms. He wasn't able to close out today's game, and the Wizards found significant success using uh, Markeith Morris as a small ball five, and Scott Brooks came out, categorically stated it, we will be going small a lot more and for long stretches, even when Dwight's back, even when Mahinmi's back. So expect a boost in Markeith Morris's playing time. We'll talk about him soon. I think this may actually impact Dwight Howard's overall upside. He might not be a 31-minute-a-game guy. Maybe he's 27 or 28 minutes. I think that's a possibility. And then in one of the late games, Clay Thompson suffered an ankle sprain. It's fine. Steve Kerr said that he could have gone back into the game, so nothing to worry about there. We also got definitive news on Fart and Will Barton. They changed it from a hip to a groin, and now it's back to a hip strain. He's going to be out about six weeks, which I think is in line with what I mentioned yesterday on the podcast. If you don't have an injured reserve spot, It's pretty hard to keep him on your team. Just having zeros at that spot for a guy who I don't believe is a top 50 player is pretty tough to do. So I'd be looking to move on. The guys who gain value are Juancho Hernan Gomez, Trey Lyles, Malik Beasley minimally, uh, and Tory Craig. But none of them rocket into top 100 consideration. Juancho was solid last last game. Trey Lyles stunk a bit. They're going to have their back and forwards. But I don't think any of them are just going to come in and demand 28 or 29 minutes per night and and vault into that you know category where you have to put them onto your roster. I don't think we're at that area with any of those guys heading into uh heading into this little you know six week period where Barton is going to be sidelined. So let's move into these uh, games now. Talk about the the action from Monday. The first game we'll talk about was a uh, a surprise to be sure, but. A welcome one for Orlando Magic fans as they knocked off the Boston Celtics 93-90. to Nick Vucevic is killing it at the moment. 24-12 and with three steals and played 33 minutes. Mo Bumba, I think, we actually had the second worst... One, two, three, four, five. He actually had the second worst net rating out of all players behind Doug McDirt today. And Steve Clifford came out and said, look, he's basically, he's not ready. He can't play big minutes. At some point, you do feel that Vucevic is going to be traded, but not necessarily. Tyreek Evans was definitely going to be traded last season. DeAndre Jordan, definitely going to be traded. Brooke Lopez, for about five years, definitely going to be traded. So I did worry with Vucevic at the start of the season what they were going to do, but if Bumper is nowhere near ready, then maybe they do look to keep Vuce around, and they can bring him, and they can play at timeshare for the next two seasons, and then let the Bumper really develop. If they're not keen on him, Vuce is a guy that in 28 minutes, he's a top 50 guy, and if he plays 33 a night, He's top 30, top 20-ish type of numbers. He's been really, really impressive. But the big story, of course, for fantasy managers is John Isaac, who finally showed us what he can do and showed everybody why I'm so high on him. 18 and 12 in 26 minutes, and he is on a minutes restriction. That's why it's just the 26 minutes. He only had one steal. He hit two threes, no blocks. And that's where really the bread and butter of Isaac's game is, his defensive numbers. If he was moved to the waiver wire in your league, I would go and add him. I believe he does have top 100 upside for this season. And when those minutes push to 30, when the steals and blocks come in, you're going to be really, really happy that you went and grabbed him off the wire. So go and do that. This is a, a positive sign for him. Same with Evan Fournier. He's his managers were panicking after the first couple of games. He's come out strongly. Now, didn't shoot well, but had 10 assists, 14 points, and 6 rebounds. Well, DJ Augustin, another big minutes night. 30 minutes, 10 points, 10 assists. If he's on the wire, he's a guy that you can consider, a guy that you can grab, because getting those assist numbers can be tough to do, and it appears that that minute split between him and Jaron Grant is now over. As for Bumba, 19 minutes with 0 points. Now, he did have 2 blocks, and he is averaging 2 blocks per game, and if you need blocks, that's useful, but I don't see him pushing to 26 or 27 minutes. I don't see him being someone who's going to really help in any other category apart from blocks. So no, he is not someone that has to be on a roster in a 12-team league. So if you go to the wire and go, oh God, what's Mo Bumba doing here? That doesn't mean you pick him up because you, it just might not work for you because I just think that it's going to be a really slow thing for him this season. Steve Clifford hates rookies. We saw that last season with Malik Monk in Charlotte. And if he doesn't think he's ready, which I think is pre-programmed into Clifford anyway, then the minutes are going to be limited for limited for Bumba. Wasn't a good as Gordon night, 13 and 3. Did play 39 minutes. That's encouraging. While Johnny Simmons and Terry Ross struggled too. On to the Celtics. A lot of people worried about Kyrie. Well, he sort of alleviated some of that. 22, 8 and 5 with two threes and two steals. 
Horford was strong, while Gordy Hayward still just the 25 minutes. 11-4-3. and three. I think we might have a couple more weeks of the low minutes for Hayward. He didn't start the second half as so Marcus Morris could start. That's going to be an ongoing theme. But I think you should be pleased enough with Hayward's performance to feel okay about holding. He did still say he has pain with the ankle after each game, but I don't think that is why that they are limiting his minutes. It will, it will come ahead. Maybe it's mid-November uh, that we're looking at that increase back to... Th- Back to 30 minutes. Jason Tatum didn't shoot well. Seven points, 10 rebounds, and four assists. This was the worry I had with him for this season, is that if the shots don't go in at an extremely high rate, will the usage and will everything else be able to stick up? Now, the usage had been high in the other games, but only 17% here. It was a struggle for Tatum. Not saying he needs to be dropped or anything, unlike his teammate, which we'll talk about in a second. But it's why I think that he was going a little bit too high at pick 40, where he was going in a lot of drafts now. As for Jalen Brown, he is struggling in a big, big way. He's the 250th ranked player so far this season, 5-5-3. Five, five, and three. And while I could say, well, he will get better from here, he won't shoot 34% from the field, uh, he won't average 9 points per game, I feel pretty confident in saying that. But the free throws are worse than they were last year, and it's not like he has this big ability where you go, well, he was a top 50 guy last year, he's going to bounce back. He wasn't. He was the 100, what, 138th ranked player last season. So do I really have to wait for a guy to maybe be a top 120 guy this season when we're bringing back Kyrie, when we're bringing back Haywood and increasing a role for Jason Tatum? I think you can find better guys on the wire than Jalen Brown in majority of cases. And I think a lot of people are holding on to him based on name brand value only. And he is just not at this point a good fantasy player. And I think we're seeing that play out before our eyes at the moment. Terry Rozier, also not someone that I think you need to hold on to necessarily. Only 15 minutes for Tez. 5-1-2, Five, one, and two, and that's the concern again. Is where do the minutes come? Kyrie, Jalen, Marcus Smart, who again only played uh, nineteen minutes himself here. There just isn't enough playing time for Rozier to be a consistent enough guy to be a twelve-team player, in my uh, opinion. Let's uh, let's roll it on to the next game now. We're looking at the Charlotte Hornets and the Toronto Raptors. Kemba Walker kept it up, 26-5-5, and five, and Malik Monk and Jeremy Lamb basically split the minutes at shooting guard evenly. 10-2-3 for Monk, 16-1-4 with a block for Lamb. Now, the guy that I am taking out of those two is Monk. Now, Lamb might outproduce him for the next three, four weeks, but I think as the season goes on, Monk's minutes will increase, and he has got the larger upside. I think with the way... We, I thought that Lamb had come out and play 30 minutes a night and be set, uh, but the way things are going now makes me think that the minutes are going to keep dropping for him as the season goes on. Batum was solid without being spectacular. While shockingly, Michael Kidd Gilchrist didn't block seven shots. Marvin Williams, not a 12-team guy, probably a 14-team at best. While the interesting scenario here was only 15 minutes for Cody Zeller, while Bill Hearn and Gomez, he played 18. Zeller had no foul, oh, one foul, 11 and five for Hearn and Gomez. And I've said this all the time. If you give them even minutes, Hearn and Gomez is by far the better fantasy producer. He needs 22. Zala needs 34 to give you about the same level of value. And if they're going to be playing the same minutes or Hernan Gomez is getting more, then Billy is the guy that you want. Now, I'm not sure that 18 minutes is enough for Bill for him to be grabbed in every league. But if he gets to 22 or 23, it'd be worth a look. I'd consider having a look there. But still, yeah, the 11 and 5 is okay, but it's it's not spectacular. It's not something where you have to rush and, and go and, and make sure that you get Hernan Gomez because Zal is still going to be in and, in and around that. And even if hey, Zal gets injured, they can throw Kaminsky in there. They can throw Biombo in there who played nine minutes. And they can also go really small with Marvin Williams and Michael Kidd-Gilquist. So I think he's always going to be limited to less than, say, 26 minutes a night, which probably puts a cap on what his value can be. Strong night for Miles Bridges, 6-3. and three. He is still just a deeper league player at this point, but he's been relatively impressive, and you have to think he will remain in the rotation all season. Kyle Lowry is killing it, 16 points, 14 assists. The efficiency is through the roof. That will drop off, but he is putting up big numbers while the fun guy. I'm a fun guy. <laughs> the Wyland, 31 minutes, 22, 4, and 3, 4 triples, super efficiency. This Toronto team looks fantastic. I picked them to make the NBA Finals. I'm pretty happy. Actually, as soon as they made that Kawhi trade, I put money on them to, to win the Eastern Conference. I'm pretty happy with how that's looking so far. Of course, three games in, but they're, they're, they're clicking. They've got so many options. Danny Green killing it, 16-6, and six, four triples a steal and two blocks. He shouldn't be on the waiver wire anywhere. Now, his shooting is just so far above where it was last season, so I do worry about a regression there. But 
the minutes are up and the defensive stats are back up, then he should be able to, to get back into that top 100 discussion. Valanchunas, I touched on him earlier. 17 and 10 with two steals and two blocks in under 20 minutes. That is fantastic. So we worry about the playing time. But the production from JV, it's there. And we always just hope, we salivate and go, man, if he got 30 minutes, he'd be crushing the top 40 very much like... Imagine him in... If he was in Nick Vucevic's situation, the numbers would be absent. And Vucevic's numbers are fantastic. But Valanciunas's would be the same, if not better. He is still the 101st ranked player this year, JV, in only 18 minutes per night. But I do worry, can his minutes actually go higher than that? Will Nick Nurse do that? I'm a little bit worried. Abaka had 15 and 8, another strong performance from him, while the Jedi, OG Ananobi. Hello there. 5 and 4 in 25 minutes, and him and Pascal Siakam look like they're just going to steal each other's playing time and steal each other's fantasy value, leaving them as uh, deeper league players as we move forward. Let's go on to the next one. It's the Indiana Pacers and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Victor Oladipo, 20 and 7, 3 assists and a block. Strong performance. I think if you're viewing him as a top 10 player, you're wrong, and you might be able to get value back from him in a trade. 112th ranked this season so far because the steals, one per game. The blocks, half per game. Well down on what he did last season, which is the thing that I talked about so much with Oladipo. Now, the other thing that's killing him so far this season are his free throws. 50% on not, and four and a half attempts per game is terrible. That will come back up, but it's that lack of defense which I thought could really push him maybe even out of the second round of discussion. So let's keep an eye on that. But it hasn't been the greatest start of the season to, for, for Victor Oladipo. Miles Turner scored 16 points. That's fine. But three boards, a steal, and a block. You knew I was hesitant about Turner. I didn't know how he was going to you know, significantly improve what he did last season. And he hasn't proven me wrong so far. DeMontis Sabonis had 8-7. and seven, And he is a fringe 12-team league guy, DeMontis. I think I would rather switch out Sabonis for Hernan Gomez. I feel it's a larger upside for minutes for Bill or grab someone like Dan Green or anything like that. It's just a consistent... They're just going to be squishing each other's value. Corey Joseph did well, five assists and two steals, but I'd leave that for the deeper formats. While Thaddeus Young actually played 34 minutes, but it wasn't good. A steal and a block, nine points and six rebounds. He's more 14 team than 12 team at this point. And again, shout out to Doug McDirt, who had four fouls in 16 minutes and three rebounds and no other stats. Carl Anthony Towns... People that drafted him, you were worried about him quite clearly. 33 minutes, but he got the double-double. 17 and 14, the shot attempts were back. Usage of 22, three blocks. A pretty strong night from Townsy. And while you can't fully you know, breathe sighs of relief, you can feel a little bit better about him doing that with Jim Butler around. Butler had 23 and 3 with a steal and a block. Another strong night from Jim, while Taj had probably his best game. Taj Gibson, 13-8 and eight with two blocks. I still don't see Taj as a very high upside player. Absolutely, he can be used. He can be rotated in. He can be rostered. But he isn't someone who I'm saying, man, if he's on the wire, why he why is he there? With Wigo playing only the eight minutes, Josh Okogie came in. He had 12-4 and four with three steals. I talked about him a lot in the draft season and post-draft summer league period, how much I really liked him long term. But getting minutes here is going to be tough. And he was out of the rotation until Wiggins got hurt. So when Wiggins plays next game, I wouldn't expect Okogie to play at all, despite him playing well and showing that he is actually an NBA talent. Mr. Uh, Mr. Flexible Tom Thibodeau, anything that differs at all from anything that he's done in the last 15 years, he can't handle it. He can't cope with it. So Okogie just won't be in the rotation because you'll give 37 to Wiggins and you'll give 37 to Butler. And you could make an argument that at some point this year, maybe Okogie is actually a more valuable player than Wiggins. I'm not ready to do that just yet, but man... It's not far off. Derek Rose fell back to earth, 11 points. But again, give credit where it's due. Another five assists. Rose is averaging five assists per game this season, and that's giving him fantasy value. Again, not someone who I consider that it would be. You know, it wouldn't be strange if I saw him on the waiver wire. I wouldn't be going, man, what's Derek Rose doing there? I added him in a couple of 16 uh, team formats, and I'm happy with that. In 12s, I think he's someone that you bring in, you bring out. And you're right, but those assists are nice. I do imagine they fall off at some point, though, for bigger, bigger Rosie. Let's go on to the next game. It is the Knicks and the Bucks. Let's talk uh, Knicks. Let's talk Mario Hazonia, who had 18, 4, and 3, two steals and two triples. This is what we hoped for for It's A Me in the preseason when he signed with the Knicks. Who's going to play on this team? It's got to be him. It's got to be the Fort. But no, David Fisdale decided, let's get Noah Vonley. Let's get Lance Thomas. Let's put Frank Milikina at the three. 
Now that Knox, and this is the other reason I was concerned, and even after this, I went, oh man, he just hates him. He's just not going to use him. And then when Knox went down, Hazonia still only played like nine minutes in that game. But this game, no, no Knox, Hazonia went off. If he is on your wire, I would be considering looking at him because he is a top 80 player. If he plays 26 a night, he's a top 80 player. Will Fisdale continue with that? We hope. There's no reason for Lance Thomas to be playing minutes, and his minutes are going down every single game, only 18 minutes here. Vonley had 11 and 5 in 19 minutes. You need to get Hazonia out there, and I think this may have clicked for Fisdale. Another encouraging performance was Damian Dotson, who had 14 and 8 with four triples and two steals. That's two games with significant minutes for Dotson. Uh, he should be playing ahead of rugged Ronnie Baker, who did suffer an injury and then was fine to come back, but never did. He should never see the court again. Emmanuel Moutier also should never see the court. I'd like to see them develop Dotson, a really good three-point shooter who showed some promising signs in these couple of games. It's really just deeper leagues for him at the moment, but an opportunity has arisen. 32 minutes again for Ennis Cantor. This looks consistent. Uh, Mitchell Robinson not in the rotation, so Cantor... Cantor, his value is spiking. Um, I'm not sure that it's really going to dip at any point this season. If Fisdale's happy to run with him at this point, then uh, you should be as well. Well, Trey Burke had 19 points. I think all of them came in one quarter. Only played 22 minutes, had four assists. He is the guy out of the point guards that you want over Frank Nilakina, who had five, one, and five in 35 minutes and plays great defense. Just an absolutely horrible fantasy player at this point in his, uh, in his NBA career. On the Bucks. Yanni played 37 minutes. He had 31 and 15 with four assists and, and two blocks. It was the first time he's gone over 35 minutes in a game this season. But the percentages are really, really killing him. And, if, and you are looking at him at, at overall the 28th ranked player this season because he is a significant negative in free throws, 62% on seven attempts, and the field goals are down at 47. Now, he was at 52% last year on his field goals, so that should come up. And the free throws should come up, but it is a concern. He's also averaging an astonishing 16 rebounds a game so far this season. Brook Lopez is making it so easy for Yanni to come in and grab those boards, so that might stick. But his steal numbers and block numbers are, are well down from last season. And you know, I think if you did take him at pick number one, you're probably going to end up a bit disappointed. Bledsoe, 13 assists with 16 points and two steals. A massive steal in the draft continues to play like that. And Chrissy Middleton, seven triples, 30 points, seven rebounds. You know, obviously 79% shooting is not going to stick, but a strong night. And this is what we wanted from Brook Lopez. 31 minutes, 13 points, two triples, and three blocks. It's not spectacular, but he blocked shots, and he hit threes, and he helped Giannis, and he... He did what we what we wanted, I guess. He's the 100th ranked player in the season in 25 minutes a night. If he plays 28 a night, he'll beat that easily. I think if he's on the wire, I would consider looking at him over some of those names I mentioned earlier, like uh, Bill Hernan Gomez and someone else who has completely uh, skipped my mind that I was talking about, DeMontis Sabonis. I would take Brook Lopez over both of those guys. Yeah, the rebounding is not great, but you know what you're getting in those other areas. And I think he should be playing high 20s rather than low 20s in minutes. Ilya Sova was limited in this game, just the 22, while uh, Tone Snell and Dante DiVincenzo combined for four points in 34 minutes. Tone Snell's um, influence really rubbing off there on the young rookie. Let's go to the next game. It's the Chicago Bulls and the Dallas Mavericks. Things are going great for the Bulls. Just fantastic. Jabari Park is bitching and complaining all over the place. Zach Levine calling out the coach and the team in general. Man, we need to run better plays. We need to run better plays. We need to recognize the hot hand, is what Zach Levine said, and said it, said it, repeated it twice because he felt like he didn't get enough touches. He had a usage of 28%, shot 15 times. And yeah, he has been absolutely on fire to begin this season, Levine. 34 points, five triples, two steals, and a block. But you know what I'm going to say? He shot 73% from the field. And you can talk hot hand as much as you want, Zach. And he is the sixth ranked player so far this season. I 100% guarantee you he will not continue to hit his two pointers at 71%. He will not continue to have a field goal percentage of 62%. This is a guy whose field goal percentage was 38 last year. His true shooting is 74%. None of this will continue. Now, I'm super encouraged by him getting to the line eight times per game. The 32 points is absolutely on fire, but less than four rebounds, less than three assists, less than a steal, and somehow he has blocked 1.3 shots per game. Now, for reference, he has blocked four shots this season. For reference, I should have put that first for reference in here. Let's try that again. He blocked four shots last season. All of last season, he blocked four shots. This season, for reference, he has blocked four shots in three games. His last season in Minnesota, 10 shots. 
the season before that, 17. The season before that, 10. So I think it's fair to say that this really, really high block rate is anomalous for Zach. Throw in the absolutely ridiculous scoring rate, the huge free throw rate, the elevated block rate, and his ranking is going to plummet. It is going to drop. He will not remain a top 10 guy because it's on the back of things which cannot stick. The scoring's been impressive. He still does not give a shit on defense. And there's no rebounds, no assists, lack of steals, and a completely high block number. It won't stick. If you can trade him for a top 20 player, if you can trade him for Victor Oladipo, you do it. I would do that absolutely immediately. And you might be able to get that trade done. Because you've got to look at these and go, there is no way that certain numbers here can stick. Could he maintain a usage of 31%? Absolutely. He could do that. Could he maintain eight free throw attempts and 83%? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, he could do that. The other things, he can't. He can't. And his largest contribution so far in fantasy is in the points category, 32, but that's fueled by his second largest contribution, field goal percentage. And when that comes down, the points come down, and then you're left with his next largest contribution being blocks, which he could go the next two months and not block a single shot. Talking about Levine a lot, but it's important to know you know, when that value is and try and maybe you know, benefit or capitalize on that somewhere. 37 minutes in back-to-back games for Justin Holiday, 16 points with four triples, two steals. Uh, when Denzel the Hammer Valentine returns, it might have an impact on Justin, but for now, he is an interesting stream type of guy. Well, this was a positive game from Jabari, but still 20 points on 57% shooter and a whole bunch of nothing. Three rebounds, one steal, Nothing too exciting, but if he's on my wire, I would consider. I would. I would go and grab him. Punch Bob had twelve and eight with two blocks, while Wendell Carter Jr. The most encouraging thing here is thirty-two minutes, two of seven shooting for four points isn't, but nine rebounds, four assists, and a block. If I grabbed him, I'm holding him. It's only going to get better for Wendell. Like he is a much better option to me than Mohamed Bamba as a rookie big man. Yeah, behind DeAndre Ayton and Jaron Jackson, obviously. But I'd have him over Marvin Bagley as well. It has been a rough start. Well, Chris Dunn made his season debut, nine points on thirteen shots. The efficiency is going to be a real problem, but he did bring seven assists and got no steals in this game, which we hope will start to come from Dunn. I still don't believe that he is a good NBA starting point guard, but on this team, it doesn't matter because the minutes are going to be there. And Chandler Hutch- Hutchison showed enough for deep league people to take a, uh, a notice of. Five fouls for Robin Lopez in nine minutes as well. Deserves a shout out. Let's talk Luka Doncic, who had 19, three and six. He's good. He's very good. He's going to continue to be good. He's going to continue to get better. 36 minutes. The minutes are there. Nothing is changing in terms of playing time, I don't think, for Doncic. And he will get better. He will He will be a top 50 player this season. I'm pretty good with that. Well, DeAndre Jordan. DeAndre Jordan has missed one free throw this season, and he has hit nine. That is astonishing. That makes him a top 10 fantasy player for this season. Big men were always going to destroy the Bulls, and he grabbed 16 boards, had 18 points, another strong night. At some point, that's going to drop off, but he took massive strides forward in his free throws last season, which went really under the radar because Drummond was dominating that discussion. But DeAndre Jordan took huge leaps forward, and if he can continue, imagine he becomes a 75% free throw shooter. Then you are talking as a legitimate top 20, top 25 guy. He's the 10th ranked guy so far, averaging 17 and 13 with 2.3 blocks on a true shooting of 74%, 70 from the field and 90 from the line. That is absolutely massive if that sticks. Big game from Wes Matthews as well. 20 points, four triples, four assists and two steals. More of a, a fringe streaming type of guy. While Dorian Finney-Smith played 40 minutes. No Harrison Barnes, no Devin Harris. That playing time won't stick. And I like Dwight Powell, a a streaming candidate, a deeper league guy. But of course, when Dirk, when the pencil, when Devin Harris comes back, it will be a little bit harder for Dwight to get those numbers. Dennis Smith Jr., not a great night. Two of 11 from the field for seven points and three assists. I am sticking with him. And if he gets dropped, I would look to add him onto my team. The next game we look at, the Memphis Grizzlies pull out the shocker. And not only a shocker because they beat the Utah Jazz on the road, but the fact that the game finished 92-84. Conley, 23-7-4 with three steals. This is why I was super into him in this season in drafts, and I got him in maybe 70% of my leagues. Marcus Gasol, I talked about how I was a bit worried about him, but 18-13-4, strong from him. Jaron Jackson Jr., Triple J. First start, 11-7 in 27 minutes, limited by foul trouble. Shouldn't be on any waiver wires anywhere. He will not give up this starting job once Jermichael Green comes back. And then the rest of the rotation, just a disaster. Kyle Anderson, 4-4-2 four, four, and two in 21 minutes. I'm happy to keep holding him. I do think that there is a heel issue. And if he gets back to 27 or 28, he will comfortably bring back top 100 numbers. But it's a struggle at the moment. 
Garrett Temple played 36 minutes. Ugh, gross. Six points with two steals for Temple. A lot of minutes, not worthy of a 12-team roster spot. I think he's more 14 or 16-team. And at some point, you've got to get Marsh on. You've got to get Dylan Brooks into those positions. You've got to get Wayne Selden into that spot rather than Garrett Temple. But I don't know whether that'll come. Rudy Gobert was strong for the Jazz. Joe Ingles, who was the number three fantasy player before today, kicked off, struggled with his shot, but still you know, felt filled up some of the other areas. But we've got to talk Don Mitchell, who is really struggling. 14-3-4 with two steals. Now, at this time last year, he was doing the same. Couldn't hit a shot to save his life, but feels a bit different. It just feels like he is pressing. It feels like he's got this num- this high usage and other teams are really focusing on him and it's taking it away. So he is really disappointing. I thought he could take a step forward in his efficiency this season. He may still do, but at this point, it's been a big step forward for the Don. Uh, I'd maybe be recalibrating. I thought he was like a back-end second-round start of the third-round type of guy. He's currently ranked 127th, mainly on the back of the shooting, which is a disaster. The free throws are well down 70%. The attempts, the free throw attempts are well down, only three attempts per game. And he's shooting 28% from three and 34% from the line. So there is elements to be concerned about. The steal rates are fine, but the assist rates have dropped. The usage is a little bit lower uh, than what it was last season as well, although I I think that will go up. But it could be, and it it depends, but it could be a really interesting buy low opportunity for Mitchell. But I wouldn't be, you know, I've heard people say, would you rather Mitchell or Devin Booker? And to me, it's it's an easy Devin Booker. It's an easy John Wall. It's an easy Brad Beal. It's an easy Drew Holiday, who are all in that similar area in the draft. I would rather have those guys than the Don, but you might get someone who's just out on him and just goes, well, no, nah, he's he's done. You know, Someone will throw out a sophomore slump term or, hey, you might even throw that towards the guy that has him on his team um, and um, try and get, use a bit of trickery to get him back onto your team. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, buy low type scenario. Derek Favors, not a 12-team guy, 8 and 7, while Jay Crowder, 15 and 8, probably is worth consideration in 12, not 10-team leagues. Uh, He is comfortably playing better than Favors. And the word out of the Jazz is that Grayson Allen is looking good, and he looked good here in his first NBA action. Expect him to get regular rotation minutes. Alec Burks, who started off the season strong, has been terrible the last two games, and Allen could take that job pretty soon, would uh, would be my guess based on what I'm hearing about the Jazz. Let's go on to the next game. It's the Washington Wizards and the Portland Trailblazers. An overtime game. No Dwight Howard. Yan Mihimi lasted four minutes. So Markeith Morris went off 28 and nine with six triples, a steal and a block. And the inevitable questions come, do I have to grab Markeith Morris? And let, let's phrase it this way. This was a career high for Markeith Morris after the you know, nine seasons in the NBA. Do you expect him to hit 60% of his shots and hit six triples a game? And if the answer to that is no, then the answer to whether I absolutely have to grab him is also no. Now, in saying that, no Dwight extended small ball. He's fine. His upside is pretty low and he won't do this again, but he looked engaged. He was energized. He was crashing the boards. He was hitting threes. He looked excellent. It won't happen every night, but for now, it's a nice little window of elevated value for Markeith, and he's fine to go and grab. Johnny Wall had 16, 4, and 9. Beal had 25, 8, and 7. And Kelly Oubre, probably his best game of his career, played 39 minutes in that small ball uh, configuration, 22 and 6 with a steal and a block, but it came on 69% shooting. Giggity! It won't stick. He doesn't do much in those other areas. Usually, I leave him more as a 14 or 16 team league player. Austin Rivers and Jeff Green both played over 20 minutes, limiting my man Thomas Sataransky, who is a better player than all those guys. But uh, Scott Brooks has some uh, has some interesting uh, thoughts on that stuff. Otto Porter, 44 minutes, 16 and 10. Now, he took shots. That's great. Took 16 shots. Really, really yeah, encouraging to see that. But... He's had a lot of rebounds in these first couple of games, and when Dwight comes back, I think that's going to really eat into that rebounding value. The defensive stuff is there from Porter. It's all going to be, can he maintain a usage of 18%, or will he go down to 12 or 13? And that's going to really depend or determine how his season ends up. I've never been a guy who's believed that Otto was a top 20 guy, because that's always fueled by extremely low turnover numbers, and you, you know my thoughts on those. Um, yeah, but a good recovery here from Porter. The, the Howard thing, given how passive Porter can be, is going to be something to monitor. On to the Blazers. Yusuf Nurkic, 22 and 18 in 32 minutes with two steals. That obviously stifled what Zach Collins could do, who had seven and five. Still added the two blocks. I love Collins as a dynasty guy. I don't think he's a 12-team guy for this season. And Nurkic is going to be so up and down. I think we're all aware of that. Lillard had 29, eight and eight. And the Chief, Al Farouk Aminu. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. It was a good day. 
for Al Farouk. 16 and 15 in 35 minutes. He is this guy who can go out and have these big games, have these huge rebounding games. He is a fringe 12 team league player. While well, Sauce Castillo, 30 minutes for Nick Stauskas. 15 points, 8 rebounds, 3 assists, and 3 steals. I don't think he's going to be this productive, but I do feel really confident that he is going to be in the rotation every night with a significant role. Think the Shabazz Napier role from last season. That appears to be Stouts because he's outplaying Seth Curry. He's outplaying Jake Lehman, uh, you know, even the Pat Connaughton role from last season. So he has value, maybe more 14 or 16 teamers, but the role is going to be there for him. Not 30, more 20, 22 minutes, that sort of thing an efficient three-point shooter. It's the best I've ever seen him look. He looks really in sync with his team. CJ McCollum, atrocious, 13 points in 25 shots. I wasn't big on him this season, and he has not been great to uh, to kick off this campaign. Let's go on to the next game now. We're talking about the San Antonio Spurs and the LA Lakers. Another overtime game. The Spurs get the victory behind DeMar DeRozan's 32, 8, and 14. His assist numbers are through the roof. His field goal percentage is through the floor. Um, but that's really strong to see these numbers from DeRozan. Obviously inflated due to the overtime game, but some, some big numbers from him. While Aldridge had 37, 10, and 5, and outside of those guys... There wasn't a ton there, but interestingly, Greg Popovich made a change to the starting lineup. He took Jakob Pertl out, didn't play him at all, and started Dante Cunningham, who had 3-12 and 12 with two steals and a block. So Cunningham, deep leagues, 30-teamers, 20-teamers. Go and have a look, because he can rebound, he can hit threes, he can do some defensive stuff occasionally, just won't score big. 16-6 and six for Rudy Gay, 33 minutes, a steal and a block, not a guy that should be left on waiver wires while Brittany Forbes had 16 points in 37 minutes. Big minutes for Forbes. He doesn't do very much else apart from score, but that can still have some value at least until Derek White returns. On to the Lakers. 32-8-14 and 14 in 43 minutes. Two triples a steal and a block. Missed two late free throws, which probably would have won the Lakers the game, but he was doing the best he could here with a, with a fair chunk of this team. Not uh, in sync and not, uh, not, uh, not actually playing due to suspension. Strong game from LeBron. We've already talked about Hart, but let's talk the future MVP, Kyle Kuzma. 37 points on only 25 shots. Four triples, eight rebounds, and three assists. Back in a more usual role, playing power forward and small forward as opposed to center where he's really struggled. Now, when Ingram comes back, it's going to be interesting to see how they use Kuzma. So they push him back into that center role, then his value diminishes, and he's probably not going to remain a must-hold guy all season. But this role obviously suits him. 33 minutes for Lonzo. 14, 6, and 6, three threes, one steal. If he's on a wire, you grab him. I don't think he's giving this job back to Rajon Rondo. He shouldn't, um, and that's that's you know means he's got to be on a roster. JaVale McGee. Now, 28 minutes is the big stat here. McGee absolutely needs to be, not necessarily your team, but he needs to be on a team in a 12-team league. 16 and 8, a steal, a block. He fouled out, and he is getting big minutes, more than I thought he could handle, and putting up some pretty good numbers. While his replacement, once he fouled out, was Jonathan Williams. He overtook Ivica Zubats. He's a two-way contract guy. He looked bloody good. 8 and 4 with three blocks for John Williams. Closed the game out, a real defensive presence. Um, someone to keep an eye on, because... Behind McGee, there's nobody there at center. And if they look to use more traditional centers instead of Kuzma and Mike Beasley's trash, yeah, maybe Williams can carve himself a role. Those for the deeper leagues, but it was impressive. Contavious Caldwell Pope, four points in 19 minutes, 12 team leagues. See you later. 14 teamers, probably as well. Well, Lance Stevenson took no advantage of Brandon Ingram being out because he's not good. Eight points in 17 minutes for Lancey. The last game of the night, the Golden State Warriors, they hosted the Phoenix Suns. Devin Booker, 28, 5, and 6 in twenty in 38 minutes, while DeAndre Ayton had 20, 14, and 5. So good numbers from both of those guys. Even though their on-court play wasn't the best, the numbers were still there. Isaiah Kanan, 26 minutes, 7 points with 2 steals. A real fringe guy. I think you put him in that DJ Augustine type of point guard on the wire type of zone. I'd probably add Augustine over Kanan. Um, yeah, I don't feel, feel super strongly about either of them uh, as uh, as 12-team players. Trevor Ariza, six points in 35 minutes. Great start to the season. I don't think he's a 12-team league guy. I've consistently said that. Um, the shooting is an issue. The usage is up, but he's just missing more shots. Not really feeling it with him. While Ryan Anderson, he's, why, why are we continuing with this? 21 minutes for Anderson, 3-3. Three and three. He, He's terrible. Seven minutes only for Jamal Crawford. Let's hope they keep him in this limited role. While Josh Jackson... Also terrible. Three points in 19 minutes. McCall Bridges is already better than Josh Jackson. 
Josh Jackson is not a 12-team league player. He is barely a 14-team league guy. That we preached caution that the numbers that he put up at the end of last season were fool's gold because they were coming without Booker, without TJ Warren, and then now, of course, without Aiton, without Ariza, without Anderson. So he was going to struggle to have that same role. And not only that, is he just looks worse on the court. Poor shot selection, just not doing enough, and not I have zero confidence in Josh Jackson. I think Bridges should be getting the majority of these minutes. I don't know whether that will come true, but I think that Kokoshkov will start to see that. And we saw 16 minutes for Bridges today and 19 minutes for Jackson. So it is starting to tilt in the uh, correct direction. On to the Warriors. Clay hurt his ankle. As I said, he's going to be fine. Steph was great. Draymond, five points, but five rebounds, eight assists, and four steals. You know my issues with him, but those numbers are holding up. But I think the big surprise here is Damo Jones really playing Jordan Bell out of any sort of 12 or 14 league viability. 20 minutes for Damo, 13 and four with a block. It's the Warriors' third year center scenario. We saw it with Kavon Looney last season. Maybe that means Bell is uh, in line for it next season, although he is a restricted free agent after this year. You can move on from Bell in 12s and probably 14 teamers, while Jones has. Some value, it's limited, but he's once one of those centers you just stream through. Uh, I'd rather him over someone like Marcin Gortat, for example, even over like Boba Marjanovic, I would rather grab Damo. Well, Jonas Sherepko in deep leaguers, he's got a role. 21 minutes, 13 and 5, three triples, three assists and a steal. And with how he is playing, with how Alfonso McKinney is playing, I don't know what Pat McCaw is doing. He's not going to get, I don't think he's going to get this role back. McKinney looks, looks strong on the wing. He's an idiot. It's been real stupidity here from Pat McCaw, and I think he is going to lose a lot of uh, a lot of money and a lot of um, not necessarily respect, but a lot of uh, a lot of common sense is going to be uh, disappearing from the. Uh, well, a lot of, yeah, maybe it is respect that I'm talking about with Pat McCaw because he is uh, not looking great at the moment for uh, for holding out and not being on a roster at this point. Let's talk some DFS, the perfect lineup on DraftKings. Eric Bledsoe, 48. TJ Warren, 44. The future MVP, Kyle Kuzma, 52.5. Markeith Morris, 47.25. Yusuf Nurkic, 52. DeMar DeRozan, 66.5. LaMarcus Aldridge, 62. And DeAndre Ayton, 47.5 for a total of 419.75 points. And that costs $49,900. On Fangel, Bledsoe, 47.3. Conley, 50. Sorry, 45.4. DeRozan, 63.6. The Hitman, Josh Hart, 38.5. Kelly Oubre, 35.2. Tony Warren Jr., 45.3. Markeith, 45.3. LaMarcus, 61.5. And Yusuf Nurkic at 50.6 for a total of 432.7. And that cost $59,900 dues. Quick correction. I mentioned earlier about uh, your Repco from the Warriors. I've been pronouncing his name incorrectly, so I've got to correct that. It is not Jonas. It is Yunus. Yunus Yurepko, as I heard him pronounce the other day. So shout out to you, Yunus, for uh, getting that pronunciation out there to people. Let's talk DFS. It's an interesting day tomorrow. There's only the three games on, so a lighter slate, lower volume, I think, is probably the way to go. I'm going to be focusing more on DraftKings uh, when we're looking at today. Now, at the moment... There's no official spread listed for the Sixers. I've been able to find the Sixers at minus 1.5. No total around at this point. And the big question is, will Ben Simmons play? And on the other side, will DeAndre, DeAndre Drummond? Will Andre Drummond play? Simmons is dealing with that back tightness. Drummond is dealing with the flu. And then you've also got the Moose, Mike Muscala for Philadelphia, who's listed as questionable. Wilson Chandler, baby neck. He is out. So a few unknowns in this game. Let's look at it from a DraftKings perspective. I love Reggie Jackson here. 5,800. The minutes are through the roof. He's already averaging 30 points per game this season. I think high pace, and if Simmons is out, it does really help Reggie. 5,800. I like him for cash. I like him for tawnies. While uh, Benny Simmons, 9,600. That is a lovely, lovely price but you can't really rely upon it for cash because even though it's the first game of the night and we'll get news of whether he's playing before lock, do you want to risk... You know, putting him into a cash lineup and then he has to sit out halfway through. He's not quite the same. Now, if it works out at 9,600, you smash through value and he can drop a 60 very easily. But I wouldn't want to be looking at it as something I absolutely have to do uh, and have to lock him into cash because there are just too many uncertainties. And in the same breath, Markel Fultz at 4,900. If Simmons is out, I love Fultz at 49. He put up 20, 25 last game with Simmons only playing the first few minutes of that game. Yeah, 25 points at 4,900 is coming close to value already, and he could easily get you a 30, a 33, a 35-pointer um, at 4,900. But again, 
I think what you do there is at the moment you throw him into a tournament because if Simmons plays and then has to sit out, you get low ownership on Fultz. But if Simmons is out, then he becomes a cash play because everyone will be on him, I believe, anyway, at that price. They could also get onto someone like uh, TJ McConnell, who is at 3,800. I'd be all about him in cash as well at that price tag if Simmons sits. Langston Galloway's a $3,500 guy. He's been getting minutes. He's not doing much with it. I think there's a reason for that. Well, Ish Smith at 41, actually like Ish at 41. He's getting a ton of minutes um, yeah, alongside Reggie Jackson. I think at 4,100 Ish is uh, he's definitely someone that I think you can look at and you can consider a, a cash option on a low uh, on a low volume day on a three game day. I think you can look at Smith and feel I guess relatively comfortable that he's going to be able to uh, yeah, I guess bring back bring back some value or enough value for us to um, be happy with it at that sort of a, that sort of a price. So I do like Ish uh, over there at that uh, at that salary. Other shooting guards to look at, you've got uh, Reggie Bullock at 4,500. Uh, I, I just not exciting. Not exciting for Bullock really at all. JJ Redick at 5,300. He dropped 48 last game. A strong performance from him. DraftKings points there for JJ Redick. If Simmons is out, I'd be happy to look at him, but still more of a tournament guy, I believe. While uh, the Duck, Luke Kennard at 3,700 out of the rotation last game, that might be the case again. So I think we can uh, I think we can leave the Duck alone. At small forward, Stan Johnson's at 4,400. I see no real interest in there, while Bob Cubs at 55 in on Bob Covey. If Simmons is out especially, probably more tournaments for Covington if Simmons plays or if we don't know about Simmons. But if Simmons is out, I'm in on Covington at 5,500. Dario Saric is at 6,100. He also will thrive if Simmons is out and then I'd look for him in cash. Otherwise, I would probably leave him alone. You've got the little dog as well, Glenn Robinson, who uh, should be left alone for a specific reason and that is he's not good. The um, centers and power forwards, Embiid at 10-4, love it. Simmons out, boosts him, Drummond out, man, it's all it's all over for Embiid. Love him for cash regardless, but there's a ton of value, and I think he's going to be in tons and tons of lineups uh, tomorrow. So for cash, he's going to be pretty hard to avoid. As for Drummond at 9,400, not sure I like the price. The uncertainty with the flu, the matchup with Embiid, it's probably one that I'd leave alone. Then you've got Blakey Griffin, who, if Drummond is out, I'm all about it. He dropped 62 last game, Griffin, $9,000. I think that's pretty uh, pretty good going there for Griff, and I'd be, uh, I'm all about using him. The Moose, Zaza, Amir Johnson. Now, Zaza Pachulia at 3,800. If we hear that Drummond is out, I can see Zaza being, uh, being of use. But I don't think his upside is massively high. But he would be an interesting guy to, to lock into a cash lineup and fill out your other prices around. Put Pachulia in, get Griffin in at that 9,000, and you know, really take all that front court production from the Detroit Pistons. On Fangel, Reggie Jackson and Embiid are your strong cash plays, 63 and 10 7, respectively. Griffin at 88 is also in a pretty good spot. While, yeah, much the same stuff that I mentioned for McConnell, uh, Landry, Sh- uh, Landry Shamet as well, uh, Benny Simmons, more of your tournament y type of players, whereas Fultz converts to cash, as does McConnell, if Simmons does end up being out, which is a possibility with that back injury, which we, uh, we just don't know which way that's going at the moment. The next game we look at is the Clippers. They are traveling to New Orleans to take on the Pelicans. The Pelicans are favored by six points, and the total is 235 and a half. That's actually pushed out now to 237. It is absolutely sky high. So this is a game that you look to stack high pace, low-ish enough spread to, to pay attention to. Real, just value all over the place. Drew Holiday, 7,400. Love it. That is a great price for Drew. He had 44 last game. He's killed the Clippers before. I think he smashes that value. I love him there. Alfred Payton at 6,400 has been impressive in New Orleans. No worries with, with getting him onto a team. Um, Shea Gildas-Alexander, 3,900. Shea had 25 points last game, a high up-tempo game. He should be able to get you pl- uh, plus 20 here in this one as well. Great value enabling you to go with the bigger names, Embiid and Davis, and try and get multiple of these guys. And I think Shea is a great low price pivot guy. Pat Beverly at 4,400, I'll fade, and Lou Williams at 5,200, just not living up to expectations. So maybe in a tournament, Lou would be interesting, but aside from that, I think you can leave him alone. Then you look at the shooting guards. Each one more, I think he's got limited upside, but I like his floor for cash. 4,200, another one of those cheaper guys to build the high price players around. That can work for each one. While Avery Bradley at 3,800, man, his price is coming down. 
and he's still not living up to it. I don't really see it for Avery Bradley at this point. For the small forwards, Toby Harris at 7,500. He is really, really strong. Good floor, solid player. I really like that for him. I think he's a cash and he's a tournament guy. Well, the Rooster, 6,300 for Danilo Gallinari. Absolutely love that. There are so many good players in this game at, at really solid prices as well. Now, Nick Miritich has been crushing it. He's averaging 52 points so far this season. That is outstanding. He's at 7,200, but his shooting numbers are bound to drop off. So I think that he might be something of a tournament guy. I'm not ready to fully rely upon him in cash. I just don't see those numbers yeah, maintaining that level. Then a bunch of other small forward, power forward players, Darius Miller, Luke Marmute, Solly Hill, Mike Scott, probably not. At center, you've got Julius Randle, 6,700. I'm in on that. I think he'll do well again. Yeah, another 30-pointer should be coming your way for Randle. You've got the table, Montrez Harrell at 4,300, who killed against Houston. But how is Doc going to use them? Will he get Harrell out there? Will he get Marcin Gortat? Probably not. Or will he get Boban? I think that Harrell has that yeah, massive upside, the ability to play big minutes and, and really, really you know, aggressively run the rim in a high pace game, which could really suit him because Boban can't keep up in this sort of pace. So I think Harrell at 43 would be the pick of the centers. And then you've got Tone Davis, 11-4. Every cash lineup, I think, should be started with Anthony Davis at that price. He is almost a guarantee to bring you back at least that level of value. While Gortat, the Polish hammer at 41. Guys, you can have that. And then uh, Boban Marjanovic at 3,900. Had played 17 minutes in the first two games, only uh, five minutes last game against Houston. I think this high pace and matching up against Anthony Davis might limit uh, Boban again, and that would obviously restrict him to tournaments, and even then, not as a, uh, not a, huge, not a huge interest. Same story on Fangio. I love Drew, Alfred, Tone Davis, Toby Harris. Nick Miritich is, is an option on Fangio as well. I think they're all good cash options. Lou Williams, Gilgis Alexander, the table Montrez Harrell, they all have value. Probably leaning a little bit more towards tournaments, especially with Shea, who's up at 4,500 on Fangio. But I still think he can beat that. I just don't have as level of or as high a level of confidence with that as what I did over on uh, DraftKings. Let's go on to the next game, which is the last game of the day. It is the Sacramento Kings traveling to the Nuggets. The Nuggets are favored by 11 points, and the total is 227 points. It's the Dr. Michael Malone Bowl here. Uh, injuries, Jamal Murray did bruise his tibia last game, came back and returned and, and struggled. But at this point, we're looking at him as a questionable player. Now, someone you'd throw into a lineup on the off chance we don't hear about Jamal Murray is, of course, Monty Morris because he would be the point guard and he will put up numbers and he is at a solid enough price. So I think that uh, Monty Morris is your interesting GPP guy for the point guards. As for Murray at 6,000, I don't think his percentage will be very, very high based on what happened last game. So that gives you a GPP potential for Murray. $6,000 is a cheap price. I think you can throw him in and he's got 45 50-point upside. I think that's really, really strong for tournaments for the Blue Arrow. Darren Fox is killing it. The minutes are through the roof. 7,100, safe in cash, upside in tournaments, into that. While Kevin Farrell, 3,700, went to the bench last game. Not sure that he'll necessarily return after how well Iman Shumpert played, but I don't want to really uh, consider him. Budrick, Budrick Heald, 5,600. Only 23 minutes last game. Still put up 26 points. I think that's solid enough. I think there is there's upside in Heald. There is... Uh, you know, a flaw in Bud, um, a high tempo game. I think that he is fine to use here and you should be getting almost a minimum 25 out of here, which is solid. Gaz Harris. Nice, Gary! 6,500 for Gaz. He was fantastic against the Warriors. He's like a 30-point minimum type of player. I really feel good about his floor as well. Torrey Craig will likely start. He will likely also not do much from a fantasy point of view. And then you've got Shumpert, who dropped an out-of-nowhere 47 points last game. He's at 4,200. I don't expect that to happen again. But if he if he is going to start, and I don't think he will, but if he is going to start, I think that you have to consider him in tournaments. For the small forwards, Bielitsa, 4,600. I really like that. Solid floor. Will he get uh, dicked around by Jaeger? Probably because it's Dave Jaeger, but I still I still really like Bielitsa at that uh, at that price tag. Trey Lyles at forty eight is probably more tournaments. While Justin Jackson and Wancho Hernan Gomez um, not really keen. If I'm going to use one of those, it'd be Wancho at power forward. Marvin Bagley at fifty one. I like this opportunity for Bagley, a high pace opportunity. He's been up and down, down last game. Does that mean he's up this game? Maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think there's an opportunity here for Bags. So I, I think he is a good tournament option here. 
to use. Paulie Millsap's at 6,200. I'm not interested in Millsap. He's just getting absolutely nothing done offensively. Then you've got Giles, who I am out on. Mason Plumley the same as well. Then it's the centers. This is where it really gets interesting. Willie Cauley Stein, 5,900. Cash, 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 cash. Uh, tournaments for Cauley Stein. And of course, Nikola Jokic. Pretty good. It's pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's also pretty cheap. 9,700 for Jokic. Can Cauley Stein stop him? Maybe. Could Cauley Stein stop Anthony Davis? Not really. I, this is a ludicrous price for Jokic. I would take him over Davis personally, um, just because I'm saving $2,000 and spread that somewhere else. But man, even though Embiid's another man, there are so many expensive centers on uh, on this slate. But I love Jokic at that sort of a, that sort of a price. Over on on Fangio, uh, Jokic again, 10-6, not quite as appealing, but still pretty good. Gaz Harris at 72. And then Bagley, Murray, Heald, and Lyles are more of your tournament type guys. I think Bagley still can have some cash value at 4,700. That does project out pretty nicely for Bags. Over on uh, over on Fangio. Let's wrap it up now by going through studs and values across the sites. We'll go to DraftKings first. Jokic at 9,700. It's pretty good. You're aware. You're well aware of that. And the value pick, I think, Corley Stein at 5,900 is um, the big question is, can we trust Jaeger? The answer to that is no. But I still think at that price, Corley Stein is worth looking at. On Fangio, we've got Jokic at 10.6 as the best stud. Easy. Uh, best value, Bagley, uh, mainly for GPP. But I do think he's got 40-point upside, which is making it interesting on a three-game slate. On Yahoo, Embiid at 44 is my best stud. And then my best value is Bielitsa, who for some reason is a minimum salary player on Yahoo. And then over in Australia, Moneyball, the best stud, Drew Holiday, 8,100. And the best value is Bagley at 5,000 as well. And on Draft Stars, my stud is Jokic at 18,680. And Bielitsa is my best value at 5,780. Guys, let's round it out now. The best bets I'm doing, it's purely experimental, but if you've bet against every pick that I've made, you would have won every one because I've missed on all of them. So let's go to continue that record. I've got the Pelicans at minus six today. Let's see if I can go a perfect zero for six to start the season. Again, just uh, just trying this out for fun. We'll keep monitoring it. We'll keep doing it and I'll keep sucking most likely, but it's been a, a rough start in the old uh, best bets zone. So let's see how that goes. Go and subscribe to this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Beeble. YouTube, subscribe, smash the like button, thumbs up, leave a comment. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Check out Basketball Monster. And of course, go follow Locked On NBA Net, where you can get all of the feeds across all of the shows, all of the pertinent information across the NBA. It's your one-stop Twitter feed for information of all 30 NBA teams locked on NBA net. Check out our sponsor today, my bookie guys. We are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jimmy Butler.